Hi again everybody. Welcome again to another part of my server build, the software component. In this video I'm going to get into something that's a bit more in the weeds than I normally do. It's going to be a product called Samba and it's a freeware Unix tool that's part of the Unix distribution but it's meant to mimic and to simulate something that Microsoft developed a few years back called Active Directory. Well, Active Directory is quite complex. As a matter of fact, let me show you an example of two of the books that I've had for years that I use for trying to decipher what it's all about. It looks like a bit more than an evening's worth of reading, don't you think? It might take two. Anyway, it's quite complex. I'm not going to use all the features of it, but my Sigma NAS comes with that service and it can be configured and I'm going to do that in this video. So hopefully if you get something out of this and you find useful, please subscribe to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. Without any further ado, let's get going. As I did in the last step covering the installation of Sigma NAS, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a flow diagram to show you exactly the steps that I'm going to go through before I go into them in detail. So we are going to be configuring Sigma NAS. It has to already be installed and configured before this flow can start. The first thing I have to know is was the root file system set up as ZFS? And as you recall, mine was. So I'm going to have to take the yes path. There are multiple steps that you have to follow before you can install Samba AD. You have to create a ZFS volume using the sparse command option. Also, you have to use compression LZ4, and you have to set a size of that as 2 gigabyte. It's going to draw that little bit from the actual pool, but it's very small. Then we have to go to the command shell. Now, there are a couple of ways to do that. You could either do the command shell right through the actual web GUI tool, or you could go right onto the console. And for purposes of this demonstration, I decided to go right onto the console. And with that console, we're going to have to create a GPT type partition. We're going to have to format that partition as a UFS file system. And then we'll have to initialize it for the first use. Then we have to create a mount point for this UFS partition. Now, why is this needed? Well, this partition is where Samba Active Directory or Samba AD is going to put all of its configuration files. And unfortunately, the Samba service does not have any knowledge of a ZFS file system. So it can only access from within the actual FreeBSD system itself, a regular UFS partition which is a standard for many operating systems, including FreeBSD. The next part actually is the configuring of the Sigma NAS Active Directory as a primary domain controller. In future videos, I'm going to actually create a secondary and possibly even a tertiary domain controller. But for this purposes, this can be perfectly fine running as just a single domain controller. A little bit risky, because if that one goes haywire, we might be locked out of our network, which is not as much of a risk for a small office network like mine, because everything here is contained within a relatively small space, and I can get to everything rather quickly. So we would have skipped those last three boxes if we did not have Sigma NAS set up as ZFS. Now, once we get into configuring, and this is done through the web GUI now, we're going to disable the SMB service. Now, the SMB service is a version of Samba used to provide network shares. Samba has a lot of different flavors to it, and one of them is used throughout small networks called SMB. We are not going to use that anymore because now it's going to use the standard domain controller services, the actual Samba AD, to provide the sharing of disk space. We must have a static IP address, as I said in the last step, for a server of this type. And I had already set that up, so there's no reason to have to reconfigure it. If there was, I would have to set that at this point before I could move on. Then we have to enable Network Time Protocol, or NTP. You have to have the accurate time for Samba AD to work properly. And the NTP service actually goes out to a set of selected servers throughout the world and pulls in the active time from it. 
I think in the United States, the one that's the primary is out in Colorado somewhere up in the hills. So it's the one service that is generally accessible for all of the United States, whether they are connected to the network or they're connected just to regular air transmission. This is important. We have to select an unused host name. Now, what do they mean by that? You can't have a host name that already exists in your network. You're going to have a conflict if you did that. So you're going to create a new one. I've already done that for my server. It's called RDNet, as you may recall. It doesn't conflict with anything in my case. Now, this is a more complicated step. You should obtain or buy, usually you have to pay something for it, an unused domain name. And I have done just that, just for purposes of making sure that there's no conflicts. I don't want my network to try to reach out to the internet and actually connect to another domain that has the same name. So I went out and paid, I think it came out to like 12 bucks for the first year to buy my own domain. And you'll see where I enter that in when we're configuring it. So for example, it'll actually be a full name that'll have hostname.domain name. And that's how the server will actually be referenced going forward. Now we have to make sure that the Samba UFS partition is actually empty. If we had our file system as something else, this would be something we'd have to worry about. But since we were a ZFS and we just created it, we didn't put anything into that. Then we have to initialize the Samba AD. You go to the actual web GUI function services, then Samba, then initialize. And that'll bring up a screen. And on that screen, we got to start doing stuff. But before we do that, we're going to reboot the server. It has to do that in order to clear up all the cache that it may have that's related to other services like SMB. Now we come back on, we have to go into Sa services, Samba settings, and this time we're going to be setting things up. Initialize didn't ask for much, as you'll see when I go through it, but the settings will ask for a lot. And in those settings will actually govern how the Samba AD service will work for us. Now, once that's done though, we are actually done and Samba AD service is up and running, but it's not going to do anything until we create some additional users. It will only have one user created as a result of the process of initializing, and that will be the administrator account, which one of the things we had to do was specify a password for that, as you will see. So it's sitting there running, waiting for connection, but the only one that could connect to it is administrator. So to really use it, we've got to create other accounts. These accounts are actually created within the Samba service that's running on Sigma NAS. However, we will actually use a Windows administration pack of tools called RSAT. On any Windows client, you'll have to download that tool set separately, as I will illustrate. Once we've done that, we can now join. That means we've downloaded RSAT. We now can join the new Active Directory domain, and that'll be connecting itself to the Samba AD running on the Sigma NAS. So that particular PC will be connected. But again, the only one who can log in is administrator. So we're gonna have to now create additional user accounts. So we create two or three accounts. When I go production with this in my home office environment, I'm gonna create many accounts to it for different purposes and for different people that use my computer systems. So everybody's gonna get their own account. But for purposes of this video, I'll probably do just you know one or two, maybe three. And then we actually test the newly created accounts. We can actually log out of the administrator account, which we needed in order to run the RSET tools. Well, first to download it and then to run them. But once we've created the new accounts with RSAT, then we can just log out of administrator on that workstation and we can log in directly as any one of the new user accounts we created. And then finally, we're up and running at that point. Once we have a real user account connecting to it, and you'll see how we log into the domain with that user at that point, we're all done. Okay, we're now at the actual Zygma NAS command prompt, and I wanna choose menu choice number six. I wanna get into a shell, which is a Unix shell or free BSD shell in this case. When you see the pound sign, it means you're in as root. That's the super user for Unix in general and definitely for FreeBSD. So you gotta be careful what you do while you're here. They are permanent changes that you will make. The first thing I wanna do is make sure that it's created the volume. So if I go to 
CD, it says it was created in slash dev slash devolve, so I'm changing directory to that. Shows you in the prompt that we're now in that directory. I now do a ls to mean list. What files are in here? It's there, if I do an ls minus l, I'll get a full listing. That's an actual directory when it starts with a D. The permissions are it's executable and readable for all different groups, root itself, and any user that's attached to it. If I now go into that directory, space. I do it again. I now have a special file. It's not a directory. It doesn't start with a D. It starts it with a C. So now I want to actually create the partitions on it. I have to use a utility called gpart. That's the one that creates partitions for us in Unix. And I want to tell it to create, because right now there's no partitions there on that Samba 4 device. I got to give it an option of minus S gpt and then i give it the full path although you could generally leave out the first part of it if i could leave out the slash dev slash in this case zval it will default to that but i'm putting it in for illustration purposes here in the video and then i got to give it the name of my pool which is rd pool which is a directory that i'm in the subdirectory and then i give it the name of that file but right now it's not considered anything until it has partitions in it. So SAM before. Now that command created the actual volume, but it did not create a partition on that volume. So I have to run it again with different options. G part, add, picking this option, which I believe aligns it properly with the blocking factor of the original volume. You can go and do a Google on this and look them up and see what these options happen to be. And then the next one tells you what type of partition I want, a free BSD dash UFS. So it's a UFS created on ZFS because Samba needs that. And then I give it the full path again. There are shortcuts to doing this with the command line, but I'm not going to use them in this video to avoid confusion if somebody's watching carefully. Got to really be careful with typos here. They're kind of hard to back up on. That happened to me the first time I tried this and I had to go and delete the entire volume and start all over again. So I double check all the options. Now these again are from the actual help file that is presented in the forum for Sigma NAT, which I highly suggest that you get into. They're very, very helpful. Hey, it's added with no errors. Perfect. One more command with G part. And all we're doing here is gonna take a look at the partition that it created. So we're showing. Just to make sure it matches what I'm expecting. In the help file, it actually shows you what it should look like. And I'll be matching it up against that. Nothing can be hurt by this, because it's just a show. Let's see what we got. Does this match up? The first number, that 40, is not relevant. It's just relevant to the file number that's assigned to it by FreeBSD. It's the real numbers are here, the four. 194224. That's critical. It actually says 2.0 G later in that line. The 8158 is critical, and that looks good. It matches up close enough. It's really the right hand side of that that matters. So now we have it there. Now there's another command we got to run that creates a file system on that partition, sort of like formatting it. New FS for new file system. We're going to use an option again. I'm not going to get into what that option means right now. You can look that up. And then I give it the full path of it again. But I have to add something at the end of it. That's the name of the original file, but the partition has a unique name to it. And the partition has a name with a P1 at the end of it. It doesn't show there in the show, but it is there. So I got to add that in there to the end of it in order to have this work. Let's see what we got. These things are hard to back up on if you make a mistake, a typo. Okay, let's try that. And that looks good. Size 496. I'm comparing it to what the expected output of it is. All the numbers match up. So now we're good. We're done with the command line options to this, which is good because this is where the high risk changes are. That's why I hope they eventually put in the GUI, a form that you can fill out because then the form they can put code behind it to make sure that it generates the command properly. It transfers from the fill-in fields of that GUI 
into one of these commands. That's what's really happening with the GUI behind the scenes. Let me go back to the other GUI now. I'm done with the command line. Okay, just one more step and we have this UFS file system created for the Samba config. If we now go to disk mount point, and then we have to click the plus sign here. The type that we want is a custom device. We have to give the full path of that partition that we created using the command line. So that was slash dev slash zval. And I would suggest you type the whole thing in here. rd pool slash samba4. And we have to have the extra piece to specifically call the partition p1. It's already set for UFS and we want to give it a name. We want to call this one samba4. So it'll be mounted as a mounted file system with that name. That's about it. So at this point, all we have to do is say add, and then we have to apply. And we're okay, we have a status of okay. And it warns you here, UFS and ZFS are native file systems. Attempting to use other file systems would cause a problem, but we're good. Oh, just one thing to note, this will actually be mounted on the FreeBSD system as slash mount, M-N-T, slash Samba4. So later when we ask for it during the Samba config as an active directory, we're going to have to specify it in that way, slash M-N-T, slash Samba4. Well, that concludes the first video. Again, I apologize for the delay in this. I'll get the next one up in a few days. I just have to make sure it looks presentable enough for me to put up. I do appreciate your patience. Take care.